Hello, one to twenty three. I think to the top five videos. What is about the documentary of World War Two? Right, let me read the title: The Complete History of the Second World War. World War Two documentary part one. Well, there is a part two. Then I'll do the part two in another video. Right, let's just react to this. All right here we go. On one September nineteen thirty nine, the world was plunged into a stalemate. Darkest years, lasting six years, the war would come to an end on second September, nineteen forty-five. It may be the only time we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beach. Jeez. Is that a real protest? That's pretty crazy. This country is at war with Germany. Over 60 million lives were lost as a result. At 7.50 a.m. There's a lot of people. At 7.50 a.m. on the morning of August the 9th, 1945, mm. air raid sirens began to ring out in the Japanese city of Nagasaki. However, a short while later, the sirens rang out again, indicating that there was no danger and people began to climb out of their shelters to carry on about their daily business. Okay. Japanese spotters had only sighted two US AAF B-29 bombers, not enough for an air raid on a major city, and presumed they were merely on a reconnaissance mission. Damn. At 1101 hours, a single bomb was dropped into the city's industrial area. The bomb detonated with the equivalent force of 22,000 sticks of TNT, which resulted in a blast so bright that it was seen by observers over a hundred miles away. Damn. The fireball generated temperatures in excess of 3,900 degrees centigrade and generated winds of up to 600 miles per hour that added to the destruction. Exact figures are unclear, but at least 129,000 people were either killed on the day or would die in the weeks and even years that followed. Jeez. Six days after this attack, Japan surrendered to the Allies, bringing to a close the most destructive conflict ever recorded that ended with the first two, and so far only, nuclear attacks in history. It was the Second World War. Damn. The rise of the Nazi party. It's impossible to dissect the causes of the Second World War without discussing the rise of the Nazi party in Germany and its okay. leader, Adolf Hitler. Right, let's learn more about him. Hitler was himself of Austrian birth, but he fought in the German army during the First World War. When the war ended with Germany's humiliation, Hitler felt especially bitter about it. And like many in Europe, he feared communism spreading beyond the borders of post-revolutionary Russia. In 1919, a year after the end of the war, he joined a new and little known political group called the German Workers' Party and used his great ability as a speaker to stir up crowds and gain support. Okay. A year later, the party was renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party, more commonly known by its English abbreviation, Nazi. In 1921, Hitler rose to become leader of the party, and again using his magnetic personality, he continued to garner more and more support. Until 1923, the Nazis were confident enough to attempt a coup in Munich, and seize power. Known as the Beer Hall Putsch, the effort failed and Hitler was arrested before being put on trial, but this only furthered the Nazi cause. Hitler used the trial to gain even more supporters, and despite him spending a year in prison, in which he wrote his autobiography Mein Kampf, the Nazis continued to establish themselves in German politics. Mein Kampf not only outlined his own story, but it also set about establishing his vision for the future of the German people. 
and how he believed subversive groups were holding them back from achieving their destiny through measures such as the Treaty of Versailles, which outlined Germany's surrender terms. He specifically identified Jews and communists as being the leaders of this great international conspiracy to keep the German people down after the war, highlighting the harsh conditions imposed on the country by the victorious allies, such as the dissolution of Germany's empire and armed forces, the loss of territory to newly created countries in the east and France in the west, and having to pay crippling war reparations. The book effectively became the Nazi Bible. Damn. By 1933, the so he wrote this book on jail and became the most popular book among the Nazis. The Nazi party had secured enough political support that Hitler legally became Chancellor of Germany. He quickly began passing legislation that would transform Germany into Nazi Germany, and the swastika would symbolize this reinvigorated country. The prosecution of Jews, gypsies, and political opponents soon became government policy as Hitler began preparing Nazi Germany to attain what he saw as its destiny cantered around the concept of the Aryan race, with himself as the undisputed leader, the Führer. Hitler and Senna. History records that the Second World War began in 1939. However, some historians now argue that it began in 1931 with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in China. Okay. The Japanese deliberately detonated a bomb on a Chinese railway line used by Japanese citizens in order to blame it on Chinese dissidents. This was then used as a pretext to invade the country and Japan would occupy the land there until liberated by the Allies in 1945. Japanese occupation of Chinese territory was extraordinarily harsh. Rape and murder were widespread and often encouraged by the Japanese leadership. While at Pingfang in northeast China, a military research unit was set up with a special mission. Designated Unit 731, thousands of Chinese civilians were used in nightmarish medical experiments to develop biological and chemical weapons, as Jeez. well as carry out experimental surgeries, often without anesthesia, That's gruesome. for fear of corrupting the data. In 1922, Benito Mussolini and his National Fascist Party rose to power in Italy. Very soon, he began reshaping the democratic political landscape of the country into a dictatorship cantoned around himself. Mussolini, like Hitler in Germany, believed his country had a destiny and wanted to build a new Roman Empire, beginning with a massive build-up of his armed forces. He was not afraid to use them and proved this when he sent his forces into Abyssinia, modern day Ethiopia, in 1935 to start the construction of his new empire in Africa. If Manchuria can be considered the first battlefront of World War II, then Abyssinia was the second. The air so the man. As the 1930s grew on, Hitler's Nazi party became firmly embedded, not just in German politics, but into German society on a whole. The German people had much to thank the Nazi party for, since they had pulled the country out of the despair of defeat and reinvigorated it, promising that Germany would soon be attaining its destiny of becoming a great power again. Hitler's appeal and influence was not lost on foreign observers, many of whom admired him and even began to sympathize with the Treaty of Germany after the war. Proof of this was given when Hitler became Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Mm -hmm. This played perfectly into Hitler's hands as he began making notions of regaining lost territory in the east and west of the country. The first test of how the Allied powers of Britain and France would respond to his new Germany came in 1935, when Hitler introduced military conscription which saw the German armed forces swell many times beyond the number permitted by the Treaty of Versailles but the Allies did nothing. Encouraged by this, he then ordered his troops into the Rhineland in 1936. The Rhineland had been demilitarized in 1925 in order to create a safety zone for France, who along with Belgium had occupied it for a time due to Germany's inability to pay war reparations. Hitler had given secret orders to his men that should they encounter French military resistance, they were to retreat because Germany was still in no condition to fight a war. 
Okay. Despite protests by France at the Legion of Nations, the precursor to modern-day UN, again they did nothing. In 1937, British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin stood down and was succeeded by Neville Chamberlain. Meanwhile, Germany continued to rearm and now set their sights on reclaiming the German Sudetenland, which had been absorbed into Czechoslovakia after the war. At the same time, Hitler looked to his own birth country of Austria to become a part of his new Germany, although this was again forbidden by the Versailles Treaty. Austria and Germany had long had an almost symbiotic relationship, and both countries' people viewed the other as cousins. Austria even had its own Nazi party, and in January 1938, they attempted their own putsch, much like Hitler had tried in 1923. The putsch failed, and many leading Austrian Nazis were imprisoned. Hitler's propaganda machine went to work creating a false impression that Austrians were rising up in support of their imprisoned Nazis. And so, on March 12, 1938, German troops entered Austrian territory on the pretense of restoring order. Within weeks, the Austrian government was gone, and the country was absorbed into Germany as the province of Ostmark. A vote on joining Germany claims that 99% of the population supported the move, which was known as Anschluss. Having secured his home nation under a greater Germany, Hitler declared himself as the advocate of all ethnic Germans in Europe, and primarily of those in Sudetenland, making clear his intention to absorb the region into Germany. A diplomatic crisis was sparked when, just like in Austria, a Sudetenland Nazi party rose up and began demanding autonomy from Czechoslovakia. The Czech government tried to negotiate with the Sudeten Germans while a series of meetings were held between Germany, Britain and France to reach an agreement on the crisis, culminating in the Munich Agreement, which effectively gave a free hand to Germany's ambitions. No Czech representative was present. First, Hitler took the Sudetenland, and then in January 1939, he invaded and captured the rest of Czechoslovakia in his first act of truly open aggression towards a neighbour. Damn. The conquest of Czechoslovakia raised concerns with the mighty Soviet Union, which was in the grip of the paranoid Joseph Stalin. Hitler had written in Mein Kampf that having to fight a war on two fronts was one of the reasons the Kaiser's Germany was defeated. And so, having already antagonised London and Paris, he was far more careful with Moscow and began a diplomatic effort with the Soviet Union to keep them out of events in the West. In August 1939, German Forest Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop met with his German counterpart, Vyacheslav Molotov, in Moscow, where the two of them effectively divided up Eastern Europe into two on the promise that neither would interfere with the other in those areas. The Soviet Union had its own interests in Poland and Finland, and so was happy to abide by this agreement, even though Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were ideological enemies. Despite this period of cooperation, many felt that it wouldn't last, but with Russia at bay, Hitler ordered his troops into Poland on September 1st, 1939. The Pinel Straw the invasion of Poland was the final straw for Britain and France. There was no justification for the invasion other than to simply capture territory from a foreign land. And so, Britain and France delivered an ultimatum to Hitler. Withdraw his troops, or there would be war. The demand was refused, and on September the 3rd, Neville Chamberlain told the British people they were at war with Germany. Unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. Mm. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Some of Germany's more cautious generals had warned Hitler that the country was not yet ready for a second massive European confrontation. Germany's rearmament plans predicted war with Britain and France breaking out in 1945, by which time they would have their own aircraft carrier, large U-boat fleets and powerful tank forces. The generals therefore concocted their blitzkrieg style of war. 
Blitzkrieg meant lightning war and called for the widespread use of tanks and aircraft to break okay. through enemy formations to capture key strategic areas and divide enemy forces up to make them easier to destroy. Above all, it was intended to achieve a quick victory rather than a drawn out war of attrition which Germany could not afford. Okay. It was first used in Poland and the Polish army proved totally inadequate for this new form of warfare. In less than a month, the Polish army was annihilated and the German army, the Wehrmacht, began consolidating their positions in Western Poland as the Soviet Union invaded the east of the country on September the 17th as von Ribbentrop had agreed to and was something that was all but ignored by Britain and France, who concentrated on Germany. Poland ceased to exist as a free country on October the 6th, 1939, and Nazi Germany now shared a land border with the communist Soviet Union. Britain and France's declaration of war on Germany sent shockwaves across Europe that were felt politically, but appeared to do very little else. Belgium, Holland and Norway joined a chorus of European voices, declaring themselves neutral in the fighting. But in fact, there seemed to be very little fighting at all. In terms of helping defend Poland, Britain and France could do very little, and instead they prepared for when Hitler would charge west. This was the start of the phony war, a period where both sides seemed to be doing everything they would normally do in a war, except all-out warfare. The French mobilised their armed forces and sent them to the border, while Britain created the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, to be sent to France to support them mirroring how the country went to war in 1914. At sea, German U-boats and surface raiders did sink unprotected merchant ships, while in the air, British aircraft made attacks on German shipping, or conducted leaflet drops over the Ruhr region. During one such leaflet dropping mission, on September the 9th, a formation of RAF Whitley bombers strayed into Belgian airspace and were attacked by Belgian fighters. This forced one of them to land, and they lost two aircraft to British defensive fire. However, in the okay. South Atlantic, a drama was about to unfold that would become a naval legend. The German pocket battleship, Graf Spee, was attacking British merchant ships, capturing their crews and then sinking them. The crews were then put on the Graf Spee support ship, the Altmark, for returning to Germany. Three British cruisers met the German ship in the battle, and managed to inflict enough damage to force the German battleship to put into neutral Montevideo, modern day Uruguay, for repairs. While there, the British began flooding local media sources that a huge British armada was assembling to destroy the pocket battleship when it left port. The German captain learned of this, and believing the situation was hopeless, he scuttled his mighty warship. In reality, there was no armada, but the deception meant potentially thousands of sailors' lives were saved. A few weeks later, British special forces raided the Altmark and rescued a number of captured merchant crews. Okay. That's good. Blitzkrieg and the Polar Prince. Everyone knew the phony war couldn't last forever, and it would only be a matter of time before Hitler struck west of France. In the meantime, Britain and France decided to embark on a campaign in Norway, then a neutral country, but one that along with Sweden helped supply Germany with vital iron ore. The Allies mined Norwegian harbours from where German ships operated, which provoked Hitler to send his forces in on April the 9th to secure them. The battle for Norway would last until June the 10th, by which time France and Britain had long retreated, leaving the country to its fate. The disaster in Norway forced Chamberlain to stand down as Prime Minister on May the 10th, and after Lord Halifax refused the post, it was offered to Winston Churchill, who as a First Lord of the Admiralty was still basking in the success of the Grafsbury operation. Hmm. Churchill was something of a surprise, having more friends than enemies in the establishment, but was a popular figure amongst the people. He would eventually form a new government made up of members of the main political parties, but in doing so, effectively suspended British democracy for the foreseeable future. He told the British people, rather bluntly, that he had nothing to offer them but blood toil, tears and sweat. Across the Channel, the French had been preparing for another war against Germany for over a decade, 
by constructing the Maginot Line, a series of turf fortifications along the border with Germany. It was designed and constructed in the belief that the war would be reminiscent of the static nature of World War I, but it was fundamentally flawed. It only went as far as north of the Belgian border, and despite popular belief at the time, it was not a continuous fortification, having several mm. gaps where it was believed that nature obstacles such as forests and hills would provide protection. It consumed huge amounts of men and resources, leading some to worry the French were putting all their eggs into one basket, as far as defence was concerned. Hitler looked at the situation and immediately saw what had to be done. He was simply going to bypass it by going through Belgium and Holland. Like the Kaiser before him in 1914, he paid little interest to Belgium's or anyone else's declaration of neutrality if it served his purpose. On May the 10th, 1940, Germany struck west, quickly overrunning Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, and okay. turned inwards to the heart of France. All the Maginot Line had achieved was to swell the fighting into neighbouring countries and effectively hand even more of Europe to Hitler. The Germans flooded France, making good use of their tanks and air forces despite being outnumbered on paper. Indeed, German tank forces were in many ways technologically inferior to the Allies in 1940, but the Germans had far superior tactics. In the air, the British and French found themselves heavily outclassed by the vaunted German Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter and sustained heavy losses. But it would be another German plane that would gain notoriety during the Battle for France. The Ju-87 Stuka was a famed dive bomber that could attack tanks and bridges with extraordinary accuracy and potency, striking terror into ground units. Damn. Later, the aircraft would be fitted with a siren in its wings that would create a terrifying howl when it entered a dive, making it as much as a psychological weapon as a bomber. Jeez. That sound is actually scarier. To compound problems for the Allies, the quick German succession and the failure of the Maginot Line to keep Hitler's forces at bay saw French morale in particular suffer terribly. Despite spirited resistance by the French army and the British expeditionary force, a sense of defeatism quickly overwhelmed them. Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain. It soon became apparent that France would fall, and so in Britain, plans began to be drawn up to evacuate the BEF back to the British mainland so they could defend Britain from what now seemed like an inevitable invasion. Dubbed Operation Dynamo, a huge armada of fishing boats, pleasure crafts, and even rowboats were assembled on the southeast coast of England to make the trip across the channel to Dunkirk, where the remnants of the BEF and elements of the surviving French and Belgian armies were assembling. In this small pocket of French coastline, the British and French troops at Dunkirk were surrounded by German troops and waited for either rescue, capture, or death. Hitler wanted to send his troops to wipe them out once and for all, but the head of the German Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, convinced him that the air force, which had so far proved almost unstoppable, could smash them on the beaches with fewer losses to German forces. Göring hoped that by doing this, he would gain favour with Hitler over some of his rivals within the Nazi high command. Mm. The evacuation began on May the 27th, 1940, with the fleet of little boats bearing down on the beaches to take men out awaiting British warships. The German Luftwaffe launched a fierce aerial bombardment and inflicted painful losses on the British. However, for the first time in war, the superiority of the Luftwaffe was finally challenged. Since Dunkirk was in range of fighters flying from Britain itself, the sea and sky thus became a brutal killing field until the evacuation ended nearly a week later on June the 4th, by which time a staggering 338,000 men had been rescued. The evacuation was seen as a victory for Britain, but those in the offices of power knew the truth. The defeat in France had not only cost the relatively small British army 68,000 men, but it had lost huge amounts of equipment such as artillery, tanks and other assorted vehicles that would be vital in repelling a German invasion. Okay. Churchill warned against the optimistic mood after Dunkirk, noting that wars were not won by evacuations. 
In the wake of the success of the evacuation, a tragedy would occur that has been largely glossed over by history. When the British ocean liner, the RMS Lancastria, attempted to escape the French port of Saint-Nazaire. I'm amazed by how much protest they can get from before the World War. The liner was taking part in Operation Ariel, which aimed to evacuate British nationals from France. When at 10 minutes to 4 on June the 17th, it was bombed by German aircraft. Exact numbers of how many men, women, and children were on board is unknown, because in the chaos of the evacuation, people were crammed into every available space. But it's estimated that between three and 6,000 people were killed, making Jeez. it the worst maritime disaster in British history. To put this into perspective, the most conservative estimates put the death toll as being twice that of the Titanic. The disaster Damn. was quickly covered up, for fear of damaging national morale. So more people died on the ship than the Titanic. On June the 10th, 1940, Mussolini waded in on the side of Nazi Germany, declaring war on Britain and France. Although Italian forces would play only a token part in the fight for France. On June the 25th, 1940, after just 46 days of fighting, Hitler's troops achieved what the Kaiser had failed to do in four years, by mm. defeating and occupying France. France was not wholly occupied by Germany, but instead the country was split in two, with Germany occupying the northern half and the south being ruled by the Vichy French government, who were essentially German puppets. The French surrender also gave Churchill concerns that France's fleet would be absorbed into German's navy and used to try and blockade Britain. In one of the most controversial acts during the war, on July the 3rd, he ordered the Royal Navy to demand the French warships at Mel Kaber in French Algeria to surrender to them. And when they refused, the Royal Navy bombarded them with shell fire, killing 1,297 French soldiers and sinking or damaging eight ships. Jeez. With France dully suppressed, Hitler was now concerned with what to do with Britain. It wasn't in his favor to destroy them, as he believed that would only hand her empire to the Americans, who were becoming increasingly hostile to him after Poland. Okay. Believing Britain was spent after the fall of France, he sued for peace, but Churchill refused, even though he knew Britain's chances of repelling a full German invasion were slim at best. Hitler therefore ordered his generals to draw up plans for Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. At the same time, Germany, along with Mussolini's Italy, met with representatives of Japan to begin negotiations for an alliance that was meant to counter the United States. Okay. This ultimately culminated in the Tripart Pact, signed on September the 27th, 1940, and saw the birth of what history now remembers as the Axis forces. Unlike Germany's previous military endeavors, the invasion of Britain had a serious obstacle in the way namely the English Channel. Hitler's military leadership agreed that it would only be possible to cross the Channel in the summer, since the weather during the autumn and winter months would be too poor to cross safely. First, however, he would have to destroy Britain's air force, otherwise his troops would be sitting ducks to British aircraft as they sat in their invasion barges during the crossings. Mm. As Germany made their invasion preparations, Churchill readied the country to do what had to be done to defend themselves. Declassified documents show just how far he was prepared to go to repel Hitler's forces, should they land in Britain. He ordered that British forces would use chemical and even biological weapons at any German landing zone in Britain, frequently saying that it's our country and we can do what we want to defend it. On July the 10th, 1940, the German Luftwaffe began their offensive to destroy the RAF. It was the start of the Battle of Britain, and German confidence was still high after their swift defeat of Poland and Western Europe. Okay. However, unlike much of the fighting in Europe, the Luftwaffe now had to be content with a well-organized and highly integrated air defense network centered around the RAF's fighting command, led by Sir Hugh Dowding. They were equipped with two of the best fighter aircraft in the world at the time, namely the Hawker Hurricane and the more advanced Supermarine Spitfire. Ten. Fighter Command's ranks also swelled with an influx of British Commonwealth, French, Dutch, Polish, and even American pilots volunteering to fight with them, many of whom already had combat experience during the battles for their own countries. Over the coming weeks, the RAF would rise to face the overwhelming German aircraft, but they were suffering for it, 
as the Luftwaffe blasted their airfields in an effort to destroy their support infrastructure. On August 13, 1940, so many German aircraft attacked Britain that Churchill was warned that the invasion was finally underway. But despite a great deal of damage being done, the RAF was still holding out against the Germans, who were joined by the contingent of Italian aircraft. By September, fighter command was at its weakest point in terms of men and machines. But then British fighter production ramped up to the point where it outstripped losses and newly trained pilots began to join the fight. Mm. However, the damage to the airfields was proving more problematic. Hitler, on the other hand, was unaware that the RAF was once again growing in strength and was told by Goering that it was barely able to put any aircraft into the air. After British bombers hit targets in Berlin, in response to an accidental bombing by German aircraft of London, Hitler decided to order his bombers to turn their attention away from the airfields in order to devastate London and other British cities. His belief was that British morale would be so shaken by these terror attacks that the country would collapse, forcing Churchill to surrender, thus making an armed invasion unnecessary. It was a colossal mistake. Fighter command effectively rebuilt and reorganized itself, and by the time Hitler realized his mistake, the summer was coming to an end. The weather was worsening, RAF fighter command was still a potent threat, and the country's defenses had been built up to where it was no longer practical to invade. Okay. While the Germans had successfully captured the British Channel Islands, Britain herself was spared. Not Africa. Just as it had been in the First World War, the outbreak of war in Europe again saw the fighting spill over into the territories that European imperial powers held control of elsewhere around the world. Britain and France held territory across Africa, which Italy's Mussolini eyed jealously. And when Italy declared war on Britain and France in support of Germany, it gave him the opportunity to invade those territories from Italian possessions, such as Ethiopia, Somaliland, and most significantly, Libya, okay. which bordered British Egypt. Egypt was vital to British interests because of the Suez Canal, which linked Britain to its Far East possessions, such as Hong Kong and India, as well as the oil-rich Middle East, which both sides desperately needed access to. Mm. On September 13, 1940, Italian forces launched an invasion in Egypt. With Britain herself still preparing for an invasion, it was left to the small contingent of British and Commonwealth troops stationed there to defend the large border against the numerically superior Italians. At first, the Italians made good progress, eventually capturing the important airfield at Sidi Barani. That's However, good. when Hitler forced to cancel the invasion of Britain, fresh troops and equipment began to be mobilized for North Africa under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Richard O'Connor. Firstly, however, they would have to make the perilous sea voyage down the North Atlantic and into the Mediterranean, where the Italian fleet was still the dominant air force after France's surrender. Heavily outnumbered, the British concocted a daring plan to attack the Italian fleet while it was still moored in Port Taranto, using obsolete ferry swordfish biplane bombers. On the night of November the 11th, 1940, the force of swordfish bombers took off from HMS Illustrious and caught the Italians completely by surprise. The attack inflicted severe damage on a large number of the Italians' capital ships, taking them out of the war for several months in order to be repaired, and thus severely hampering Italy's efforts to disrupt supplies to North Africa. Unfortunately, the British still had to contend with air and submarine attacks. The task of expelling Italian forces from Egypt seemed immense in the late 1940, and yet the newly arrived British forces managed to achieve just that. The British retook Sidi Barani, and by January the 3rd, 1941, were already pushing forward into Libya. In two months, a British force comprising of just two whole divisions had advanced 500 miles, destroyed 10 Italian divisions, and taken 130,000 prisoners, Jeez. as well as capturing over a thousand tanks and artillery pieces. Operating from Italy, the German Luftwaffe began supporting the Italian operations from the air, but things on the ground continued to go badly for the Italians, with British forces capturing the strategic port of Tobruk on January the 22nd. 
Confident of Italian defeat, Churchill began his plans for helping to defend Greece and the Balkans from a joint German and Italian invasion. However, Germany decided to send two of its own divisions to help shore up Italian forces in North Africa, which would form the nucleus of its Africa Corps under the command of Erwin Rommel. Mm. Rommel was a gifted leader and tactician who understood tank warfare better than most generals in 1941. The plans of North Africa were ideal for tank combat and Rommel's influence was almost immediately felt. He attacked El Aguila on March the 24th and then pushed east across Libya back towards Egypt. However, he failed to retake Tobruk and instead laid siege to British garrison there, which held out for a staggering 240 days, providing a severe thorn in the side of the Axis forces and tying up resources. On April the 14th, British and Commonwealth forces had been pushed back to the border and had even captured General O'Connor and his replacement, General Neen. But Rommel's forces were struggling with the logistic problems, which Hitler feared the British could take advantage of. Fuel was such a concern for the Germans that they began efforts to steal it from the British, which resulted in British troops referring to their fuel cans as jerry cans. Mm. By May, yeah. Rommel was forced to halt his advance at Hellfire Pass in Egypt while he resupplied his forces. Under General Wavell, the British did indeed counter-attack in June, hoping to cut off Rommel's supplies and force him to surrender. But Rommel outmaneuvered him and the attack failed. As the year went on, the British became obsessed with killing Rommel, who had earned the nickname Desert Fox, and even sent a commando raid to assassinate him, which ultimately failed. For the next few months, the battle lines fluctuated, but Rommel's logistical problems continued to hold him back and worsened when Hitler began to focus more on other fronts. With Hitler being forced to call off Operation Sea Lion in 1940, the Germans recognized that their window to invade Britain had closed and it would now be impractical to attempt another invasion. Britain was becoming Fortress Britain and so Hitler turned to a medieval method of warfare, the siege. Hitler knew that Britain relied extremely heavily on war supplies, material, and even food coming from her empire and North America. Okay. Therefore, he turned to his navy, the Kriegsmarine, and tasked them to cut off this vital supply. Jeez. The Royal Navy was still the most powerful surface fleet in the world in 1940, and while Germany had advanced warships, like the Tirpitz and Bismarck, they couldn't hope to meet the Royal Navy in a pitched battle like the Kaiser's fleet had in World War I, without being overwhelmed by British numbers. Therefore, the German Navy used their U-boats to besiege Britain. The Kaiser's U-boats had proved how vulnerable Britain was to such a weapon, but it seems Britain had learned very little from this during the interwar years. Tactics to combat the U-boats had changed very little and new technologies such as ASDIC, an early form of sonar, had yet to take prevalence in the fleet, meaning the main method to detect a U-boat was to spot it on the surface recharging its batteries or when using its periscope. Aircraft was seen as ideal platforms for this, but RAF's coastal command had aircraft inadequate for the job at the start of the war, lacking range and weaponry, but also having to rely solely on the aircrew's eyes for detection. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy began organizing merchant ships into convoys in order to provide them protection, and also began taking on trawlers from Britain's fishing fleets and arming them to hunt U-boats. Nevertheless, the U-boats began to inflict painful losses on Britain, while efforts to destroy them at sea met with mixed success, as did RAF Bomber Command's efforts to bomb the U-boats' yards in France and Norway. Churchill would later admit that the U-boats were the only thing that truly scared him during the war. However, the U-boats needed help in locating the convoys, and so the Luftwaffe used long-range Condor patrol aircraft to organize the U-boat attacks. Realizing this, Britain began looking at ways of destroying these aircraft. There weren't enough aircraft carriers in the Royal Navy during the early years to protect every convoy, and so they came up with a novel solution. Catapult merchantmen, or cam ships. These were merchant ships equipped with a catapult to launch a single Hawker Hurricane or Ferry Fulmer fighter 
to attack the Condors when they were sighted. Hello. It was a one-way mission, there being no way to recover the aircraft, which had to ditch alongside the convoy, with the pilot hoping to be picked up by a passing ship, which made it one of the most dangerous jobs of the war. The urgency to combat the U-boats saw the rapid development of technology, particularly in the field of radar. The U-boats had to ride on the surface to charge their batteries that powered them, and this was often carried out under the safety of night. However, radar had been used to combat night bomber raids, and was now being trialled against U-boats. On December 22, 1941, a U-boat was sunk by a Royal Navy plane on the surface under the cover of darkness. Mm. From that point on, U-boats could be attacked anytime, anywhere. The situation was made worse for the U-boats by the addition of new, longer-ranged aircraft equipment with radar, which Damn. left fewer and fewer places for them to hide. The Balkans and the Great Campaign. At the same time, Mussolini's Italy opened the North African campaign. His troops also opened up another front, this time against Greece. Mussolini felt he was playing second fiddle to Hitler in Europe, and wanted to establish himself as an equal. He viewed Greece as an easy target and began putting pressure on the country's own facet-like dictator, Ionis Metaxas. On August 15, 1940, an Italian submarine sank the Greek warship Eli. Italian troops finally attacked on October 28, 1940, but like in North Africa, they were beaten back despite the odds seemingly being in their favour. The Italian attack pushed Greece closer to Britain, who were desperate for allies after the fall of Western Europe. This in turn made Hitler take an interest in Greece, and he had his general staff start drawing up plans for his own troops to once again come to the aid of the Italians. The problem was that Germany had no land border with Greece, it being blocked by Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. Hitler demanded cooperation from both nations to allow his forces to pass through. Bulgaria agreed, and so too did Yugoslavia, both of whom joined the Axis forces. But public opinion in the latter was strongly anti-German, leading to a coup against the government and the rejection of any alliance. Outraged, Hitler ordered that when his troops invaded Greece from Bulgaria on April 6, 1941, Damn. that they were to concurrently invade Yugoslavia. Despite stiff resistance, Yugoslavia was overrun in just over a week and a half. Two weeks later, the Greeks surrendered, having been overwhelmed by the combined might of the German and Italians. British assistance could do little to repel the invaders, and along with the Greek forces, they retreated to the island of Crete. Consolidating his position on the Greek mainland, Hitler ordered the invasion of Crete to begin on May the 20th, and was opened with a massive attack by German paratroopers. After nearly two weeks of fierce fighting, the island fell, but while British and observers in Washington were impressed with the effectiveness of a paratroop invasion launched against them, Hitler was appalled at the cost of his forces and never again ordered a large-scale airborne invasion. Operation Barbar Nazi Barbarossa. Nazi Germany's army seemed unstoppable by mid-1941, and no one became more convinced of this than Hitler himself, who, after defeating the British on mainland Europe in France and Greece, and while Rommel continued pushing them back in North Africa, decided that it was time to achieve his ultimate goal, the destruction of the Soviet Union. Hitler viewed the Soviet Union as a way of not only eradicating communism, but of feeding his thousand-year Reich by providing vast areas of agricultural land and vital resources such as oil and metals. However, Germany's generals warned the Fuhrer against invading the Soviet Union, unless Moscow attacked first. Britain herself remained unconquered, and worse still, was now sending fleets of her bombers into Europe to attack German industry. Also, the job of defending British and British Commonwealth forces in Africa required the resources Hitler wanted to commit to fighting the Soviet Union. They believed it was better to send those forces to destroy British resistance in Africa, and then seize British possessions in the Middle East which would afford them oil, which would starve Britain of her supplies, and eventually help force London to surrender. But Hitler was impatient. He argued that the German people would not be as supportive for a war on Russia after a few more years of fighting. Also, he believed the Soviet army was incompetent after its poor showing against Finland in the Winter War of 1939. 
If he waited, then the Soviet leadership might learn from their mistakes and become a more credible threat. Hitler would say, we only have to kick in the front door and the whole rotten Russian edifice will come tumbling down. He defied his generals and gave the order to attack the Soviet Union. Dubbed Operation Barbarossa, Germany committed a huge force of troops that included Romanian, Finnish and Hungarian units who were by now signed up members of the Axis forces. The attack was launched from occupied Polish territory at 0300 hours on Sunday the 22nd of June 1941 and involved a staggering 3.8 million personnel launched across a 2900 kilometer front. Damn. The German forces were arranged in three key army groups North, Centre and South. The Soviet army had warnings that the Germans were amassing for an invasion, but Stalin refused to believe it. In the days after the invasion, Stalin retreated into his own mind. He being unable to comprehend just what was happening, which left his government that was terrified to act against him, following his brutal purges, unsure what to do. The Soviet army sustained incredible losses in the early years of the war, while the Soviet air force was largely smashed on the ground. The aircraft that did get airborne were often obsolete types or their pilots poorly trained, making them easy targets for skilled and experienced German fighter pilots. The Soviets also had to contend with anti-communist forces conducting sabotage and intelligence gathering operations from the Germans. The fighting in the East was particularly brutal. Hitler had told his forces that a war against the Soviet Union could not be fought along civilized lines and as such, he promised no German would ever be held accountable for his conduct against the enemy. Mm. In a sense, they were given a free hand to rape, plunder and murder. Jeez. When Soviet units were overwhelmed, many of them surrendered as their command structure collapsed and these soldiers were led into captivity, where there was an actual plan in place to starve them to death. Behind the German troops advance, German death squads began murdering so-called undesirables such as Jews. The speed of the German advance took everyone by surprise, including the Germans themselves. The vast areas of land Germany's forces took proved a logistical nightmare, and on several occasions they lost the initiative as they waited for supplies of food, fuel and rearmaments to catch up with them. The Germans advanced across eastern Poland, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine and into Russia itself, proving almost unstoppable but everyone knew that the biggest obstacle the Germans would have to face was rapidly approaching, the Russian winter. Mm. By December 1941, the snow was setting in, but German troops were on the verge of taking Moscow itself. However, they failed to take the embattled city and their advance ground to a halt. The Soviet Union's leadership, meanwhile, had relocated their major weapons production facilities further east out of the range of German bombers, which allowed them to build tanks and aircraft unmolested. They were also getting supplies from Britain, thanks to the efforts of the men on the perilous Arctic convoys. The German army leadership knew the truth, even if Hitler remained convinced of Germany's superiority. They had lost their window of opportunity to destroy the Soviet Union quickly. Now the Soviets were engaged, committed and far more prepared for the coming war of attrition than Germany was. Okay, okay. In Mein Kampf, Hitler had outlined that Germany could not fight a prolonged war on two fronts. Yet at the end of 1941, he was effectively committed to three fronts. Britain in the West, British Commonwealth forces in North Africa and now the Soviet Union in the East. And while the snow fell on German soldiers in Russia, ill-equipped for winter warfare, a world away in the tropical climate of Hawaii, a fleet of Japanese ships were closing in on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Damn. So the battle is going to be about the Pearl Harbor and the defeat of the Nazis. But that was a really good informative video by Top Hub. I have learned a lot about World War II and in schools. This is a really good video. I'll do the battle soon. Stay tuned for that one. Also, let me know down in the comments what other songs or videos would you like me to react to next. Literally, any song or video you want, request me in the comment section below. I'll react to it within a few days or in the same day, maybe.
If you want to check out all my recommended equipment used in the video, check out the affiliate links below which can get a small commission but no extra cost to you. Also, don't hesitate to comment what you thought about this video. Okay, I'm gonna end the video there. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and get more subscribers. Hit that bell notification so you won't miss any uploads and you get notified every time I upload a video. Like the video to help out YouTube to recommend this video to many people around the world and share this video with your friends, family and relatives. And I will see you in the next video. Bye bye.